Hey, good evening, everybody. We're uh, live and online. Get your Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis. I've changed sides tonight, which means I'm looking at a different deacon tonight that sits on this side instead of the one that sits back here. So Cecil gets a break. Uh, I won't be staring at you tonight, Cecil, because usually I stand over here and I can see... And now I'm over here and I can see Randy right on. So, uh, boy, he's going to get the brunt of it now. Turn to Genesis chapter 30 in your Bible. I'm excited about our new study tonight. Uh, we are in learning through the lives of others. We've started back. This was a series we did last year for those online. Um, we had 60, and then we started again this year, and we're going to do some more because... There's so many good things. I love these. It takes a lot of reading because um, I try to do extra with these. But I did not do this individual because uh, it's going to take more than one week. Romans 15, uh, 4. Whatsoever things are written before time are written for our learning. And uh, we, we want to learn from the lives of others. The example of others should teach us something. You learn by example or experience. And uh, if you read in the Bible, they're given so that we can have some learning about their good points and bad points. One of the ways we know the Bible is the Word of God is that He tells us the good and the bad. If you were writing a book about you, you would leave out some chapters. <laughs> Me too. Uh, I've always said, it's really goofy to ask somebody to give them a resume. You know, churches say, send me your resume. Well, what bad things do you want to say about yourself? You know, I'm lazy, I don't get up till 10 o'clock in the morning or something like that. No, uh, you would say good things. So um, learning by example is the best way, and God gives us the good and bad points. So tonight we're starting a journey of about three or four weeks, maybe, uh, maybe more than that. Uh, I didn't do Joseph last time as we went through it. I, I didn't do several, but I tried to stay away from several weeks in a row with one person. So you got to stay with me on this. Joseph, and tonight we're going to talk about Joseph and his family. So this is an introductory lesson tonight, but I think it's going to be a blessing to you. Let's see Genesis chapter 30, 22 through 24, and God remembered Rachel. And God hearkened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. Uh, the first five books of the Bible we call the Pentateuch. It comes from a Greek word meaning a five-volume book. Uh, the Jews called the first five books of the Bible the law or the Torah. And uh, each book or originally received its title based on a word or a, a phrase that it starts with. And so somebody asked me that a while back. Uh, why is Deuteronomy Deuteronomy? All those five books, that's where they get their, their titles. And uh, there are three divisions in the Hebrew Bible. There is uh, the Torah, or law, and there is the writings and the prophets, just three. We divide it up a little differently, and so the Torah was originally, the law was originally one book. It got changed, um, really, when the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew. Uh, by the way, the, the Septuagint, you need to kind of keep in your mind, uh, is a very important translation. First of all, it is a good early Hebrew Bible translation into Greek, which was the common language of man at that time. And uh, it was about a thousand years prior to the earliest manuscript that we had. So it was way back. The earliest manuscript we have now, intact manuscript, the Hebrew Bible, is about 916 AD. So this was back a thousand years prior to that. And so we, uh, it is amazing how God does that to where we can look back and guess what? It hadn't changed. Still there. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls was an amazing, am 
amazing discovery. And if you get a chance to read about that, um, I've been to Qumran over there where the little shepherd boy was looking for sheep and he threw a rock back in a cave because he wouldn't want to go in a cave. It's all, all kinds of caves back in there in that sandstone area uh, north of the Dead Sea. And he heard pottery break, and so he went and got somebody, and they, came, and they found where uh, the Essenes had hid those scrolls. And, you know, the uh, liberals had said, well, the book of Isaiah, you don't have an intact manuscript very, very late, I mean, very early, so uh, it's probably got errors in it. Guess what? They found one. Uh, last time I was in Israel there at the uh, Museum of Antiquities in Jerusalem, they have that Dead Sea Scroll around. It was really neat to... Uh, copy all around where you can see and I've been at several uh, events to see fragments here in the United States that traveled in shows. I was in Grand Rapids some time ago and they had one museum over there and I went over there to see the different fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls and different books and it's just really cool and uh, but God always makes sure that we know his word is still his word and he makes sure uh, that he preserves it. Uh, God took all that time to write the Bible. He's not going to let it go away. It is a living document, and he's going to keep the purity of his word. So anyway, um, the Torah was originally one book. When they, when they translated the Septuagint from the Hebrew Bible, um, which took place as an early manuscript. By the way, it also took place before the second century when some of the rabbinical schools changed a little bit of the Hebrew. So it, it's a very early, uh, very early manuscript, uh, excuse me, very early translation. Uh, it divided in five books. The five books we have now is kind of based on that. Instead of one book, same content. So uh, this book we call Genesis. Do you notice that? And uh, it comes from those first three words in the beginning in Hebrew. One word in Hebrew, three translated into English. And so it's about the beginning starting with creation. I said that to say this. We also have in this book the beginnings of God's dealings with mankind and the beginning of the story of redemption. Joseph, Jacob, uh, you remember Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Joseph is going to have an impact on the people of God in the plan of redemption, in the story of redemption. Joseph's an important character. He is a type of Christ. Uh, a type meaning he's not Christ, but as a savior for the people. And there's little, so many different ways. I have a book somewhere in my library. As I walk through, I try. I thought I could see it, but um, I'll have to look for it tomorrow. I have somewhere in my uh, library a book by Arthur W. Pink. A.W. Pink has a book on 150 types uh, of Joseph being a type of Christ. It is amazing how that he is like Jesus in se several Areas. In fact, he has 150. I think that's too many. I mean, that's a lot. But uh, you can see that in Joseph. So Joseph uh, is an interesting character. You know, it is in God's plan that Joseph is born. I thought about this. Uh, God gives us many choices in life, but he does not give us a choice of where we're born or when we're born. Or in what circumstances? Uh, it is a sovereign choice of God. Joseph was born when and where God chose. In the family God chose. He was born into the plan of God. Uh, we are born into a place and time that God selects. And like Joseph, we're not a, maybe a type of Christ, certainly. But like Joseph, God has a plan for our life. We have no say-so in where we're born or what family we're born in or what country we're born in or uh, what cultural setting we're born in or what race we are born in. We do not have a choice in the economic situation we're born in. We don't have any choices. It's a sovereign choice of God to place you in this time in the family you were born in. Amen. And in the place. God chose to put Joseph in that family. Now, just as Joseph will, we have to decide whether or not we're going to follow God. And there's some 
uh, great lessons to learn from Joseph and his fidelity to God. God places him with a loving mother and a loving father. And uh, his father Jacob's in the lineage of those who follow God. Uh, but in his early years, he was a deceiver. You remember him, Jacob and Esau, the, the twin boys. And not having full scripture, Jacob is going to follow ways of those around him. And uh, not like Adam and Eve, he's not going to be one man and one woman. He is going to be corrupted by the, the people around him, and that was in the culture he was born in. He's going to father uh, children by two wives and two handmaids. It's a, it's a crazy story, it really is. Perfectly acceptable norm in, uh, of the heathen, but never of God. God never said, well, I, I'm for that. No. Uh, why did God tolerate it? Well, New Testament says he treats them in the Old Testament like children because they did not have full revelation. They didn't have hardly anything. Uh, was God happy with that? I don't think so. Can God work through that? Yes, he does. And it is kind of amazing. Now, Joseph is in the plan of God, not in the lineage of the Messiah. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But being instrumental in the plan of God for the nation, Joseph will have 10 older brothers. We're not going to get to those tonight one younger brother and a sister. Unlike a single mother and father that has this big family, when I was a boy, they, there was somebody that was close to us uh, location-wise that had 12 children. And they had them at all stages. You know, I mean, you know, the grown ones finally take care of the little ones. Jo uh, Jacob did it this way with the two wives, Rachel not being able to bear children at first, and the two handmaidens, Leah being able to bear children, they're all close together in age. This is one group. That's going to play into some of that jealousy that we find in the life of Joseph. Now, uh, there's going to be much conflict in this home. It's an interesting story. It begins, really, I want to go back in the story, and we'll talk about uh, the rest of them after a while. But I want to start with Joseph's grandfather, Laban. You remember? They moved over, and uh, the first six years of Joseph's life, uh, he's going to live with his family at his grandfather's, uh, whatever you call that, uh, gathering ranch, whatever you call it. He was uh, quite wealthy and had a lot in Padanamaram, which is a flat land off the, uh, of Aram, it's near two rivers, northern part of Mesopotamia. And that's where they're going to live. So first six years of his life, those are impressionable years. Um, it's funny how children, little children, pick up so much in those early years. Never discount that. I think if I had to choose a group to work with, it'd drive me nuts. But I'd have more influence if I could go to the nursery age. You know, everybody says, well, I want to work with teenagers. Time you get them as teenagers, uh, wow, they're a long way down the road. That learning begins early. And those children pick up stuff. Uh, I'm amazed at what they pick up every day. So Joseph's spending the first six years of his life with his grandfather, living where his grandfather lives. Laban knew about Jehovah and seemingly respected Jacob's God, but it wasn't Laban's God. You see, Laban was a committed uh, idolatrist. He was. He never changed. So Joseph is introduced early on in his life to a choice. He, early in his life, had to decide, or he could see, he didn't decide that early, but he could see the difference between serving God and serving idols. Right in his home, he could see it. The true and living God of his father or his mother gods of the world and his grandfather. He would have seen his grandfather worship and serve other gods and statues and figures. Gods who can't see and can't hear and can't uh, talk and can't move to hell. They're idols. The contrast was the God of his grandfather Isaac and his great-grandfather Abraham and his own father Jacob 
and that of his other side of the family, his mother and grandfather Laban. So there is a choice. Now this God that Abraham served and Isaac served and his father served speaks, moves, he's living, and he blesses. Now think about the contrast there. On this very first night away from home, this God spoke to his dad, Jacob. Remember that when he left and he had deceived his brother and he was on his way and God spoke to him there at Bethel. Uh, so much so that he saw that great vision. You remember that? He was running away. And uh, he said, this is the house of God. And God uh, uh, communicated with him and uh, told him he was going to bless him. So as he was heading to Padan Maram, Jacob, this very God of heaven spoke to his dad personally in the night. Uh, you cannot tell your grandchildren and the little ones, you can't tell them too much about the God who speaks. Don't tell them about your conversion experience. Man, you have a living testimony and, and little ones need to hear it. Uh, God speaks. And uh, in your life, God moves. We don't serve a dead God. We serve a living Savior. He's in the world today. And uh, that's the God, of course, of Jacob and will be Joseph's God. Now, his maternal grandfather Laban uh, didn't know God personally, knew him at a distance, and, and knew that Jacob was there. In the business world, Laban knew what he was doing. He was prosperous. Good and shrewd businessman, which I believe Joseph watched from early on in his formative years, I think it would serve him well in the future. So he has this influence, and he sees the other side of things. And then there's his mother, Joseph's mother, Rachel, in the home. Um, she was a beautiful woman, apparently, much more physically attractive than her older sister, Leah. His father Jacob had met her at the well. You remember that? She came out to draw water for the sheep. And, um, her father's sheep, Jacob, uh, was in love with Rachel. You remember that? Oh, wow. I fell in love with her. Um, and uh, his uh, Joseph's old grandfather, Laban, uh, in a shrewd businessman that he was, he sold his daughter seven years of labor. And then he finagled away to get him seven more years by doing something quite unscrupulous. What did he do? Well, and uh, after the wedding feast and the wedding night and uh, the darkness of the tent, he slipped in Leah veiled as the brides were. And that night, uh, Jacob thought he was with Rachel and he was with Leah. And he woke up the next morning and said, who's this? And uh, wow, the deceiver, and that's kind of ironic, the deceiver got deceived by his father-in-law. Mm. And uh, so he's going to have to serve another seven years. Now, Joseph's going to hear all this. He's raising this family. Uh, family secrets go around in the family. Oh, yeah. And speculation, but especially things that happen to the family, they might not tell everybody uh, about it, but they're going to tell the family. A good thing God told us about it. And so he finagled away for Jacob to marry his older sister, the older sister of, of Rachel, Leah, and get double service. So in the home, there's this dysfunctional situation. This is one of the first dysfunctional homes you see. I mean, this is a dysfunctional, strange situation. Joseph could see the great devotion uh, and love of his father had for his mother. Because of his great love, Joseph would be loved by his father more than all the other children. This is important to understand. Uh, he's got all those children, but he loves one especially, and that's the firstborn, uh, Rachel. It's Joseph. And all the others know it. They don't like this. Joseph would have learned a couple of things from his mother. First of all, uh, he learned something about patience. Beyond her love for his father was the patience she had. She waited seven years 
Uh, wow, that's a long time. If she was as attractive as the Bible makes her out, I think a pretty girl like that could have got married quicker than that to somebody else. But she waited seven years and uh, had great love carried with it, patience. She surely gave some of that to her son. I'm sure she did. She surely told him her long and frustrating journey to have a child because God would not bless her for, with children. We read that where God did finally allow her to conceive and have children. That's fl frustration for a woman that wants to have a baby and wants to have sons for her uh, father, especially in these days. But in this patience, uh, impatience, excuse me, she told her husband, give me children. What's wrong with you? I, and uh, and he said something very interesting. He made it plain only God could do that. He said, Am I God? He said, Wait a minute. Am I Elohim? That's the word he uses. The one with plenty and power who created the universe, the creator of God? Am I the one that no? Who creates and who establishes that? Who blesses with children? God does. He has that power, doesn't he? The second sphere of influence from his mother is not a good one. Uh, I call it emptiness and folly. He learns firsthand about this emptiness of pagan gods from his mother. She was quite devoted to the gods, so much so when they leave, if you remember they travel, she's going to steal them. They mean so much to her. Uh, she's unlike her sister, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But he learns about the folly of these pagan gods and uh, the countless idols. This is going to serve him, I think, pretty good down in Egypt. Egypt, when he went down there, they worshipped all kinds of animals. The cattle and everything from uh, animals to insects and everything was a god. He had a background to deal with that. I said that to say this. God places us sometimes in a learning that serves us in the future. We don't even know it until we get there and we go, wow, God was preparing me for this. And I think that helped him a whole lot. But he saw firsthand the, uh, the total emptiness of serving idols. If you don't serve a living God, uh, man, you're missing it. I say people today, man, if you don't get saved and have the Holy Spirit inside, you have an empty life. Amen. And so she had an empty life. Rachel dies when Joseph was about 17. So he was a young man. And he saw this. He watched his brokenhearted father, who loved her above everyone else. I mean, he loved her. Uh, he watched her be buried outside of Jerusalem, over toward Bethlehem. And Joseph himself's heart was broken in only a way God can bring comfort. The only one that brings comfort when people die in your life is God. I've been down the road too far and done too many funerals. Uh, you can't say enough, and yes, I've been through it, and yes. Um, but I tell you, ultimately, God is the one that's going to bring comfort. If there's comfort to be found in deep sorrow, it is God that does that. Well, let's talk a little bit before I run out of time. I've got to get on. Let's talk about his uh, aunt and uncle. Just two of them I can talk about a lot. But two of the popular ones. Uh, his mother's sister and his father's brother. That's what I'm going to talk about. His aunt, Leah. This interesting study, I, I learned some things that in reading again on this that I hadn't thought of before with Leah. His mother's older sister, Leah, was in a strange situation. She did what her father asked her to do, and it caused the most dysfunctional family uh, ever. Uh, he grew up in this with his mother's older sister and his father's first wife. So he has in his family his aunt Leah, who is daddy's wife. I don't even know what you call this. And his mother, who's daddy's wife. And he's got all of this strange relation, and she's going to have uh, several. So his father tricked into marrying her by his own uh, granddad lady. And so, you know, uh, it's such a dysfunctional thing. So 
It's a terrible trick to pull. And so Jacob did not feel good about Leah, but Leah loved Joseph. She was devoted to him, even though she did not, uh, he did not love her like Rachel. I picture her as a very sad woman. She wanted this uh, husband to love her and wanted uh, to do right, and he was never going to love her like he should, but we're going to find out later on that might not have been the case all the way through. But Joseph must have watched as she did her best for his father, even though he never loved her like his own mother. He surely saw her crying many times. I tell you, in a home like this, in her sadness, but she stuck it out, and God blessed her with six sons and a daughter. She was lowly and despised by her own hus husband and somewhat by her sister. And somehow she sought God. I'll read a verse here in Genesis 29, a couple verses. It says, And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah conceived, bare a son, of course, the firstborn named Reuben. She said, Surely the Lord capitalized in uh, King James, the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. The Lord, Jehovah, that's that special name of the personal God that we walk with. And so the one who has the power to change all things, Leah had much more spirituality than her sister. She had a knowledge of Jacob's God. She mentions it here. Laban doesn't call him Jehovah. That's a personal name. She does. Leah, uh, her faithfulness is blessed by God, and she recognizes that. It would be Leah, by the way, that God is going to bless in an unusual way. She is going to have the privilege of bearing the son of the royal family, Judah, the lineage of Christ. David, Solomon, he is a line of the tribe of Judah. Interesting. Leah. Uh, also, she was going to be bearing the priestly family of Levi. God blessed her exceedingly, these six boys. Uh, somehow his aunt had picked up on what Joseph's mother had not, that there is a personal God of heaven. Uh, I believe she must have worshipped him to, to call him that. But anyway, he was real. She knew he was real. She knew Jehovah. The Lord had seen her pain and blessed her. It's an interesting take on her. In fact, it's even more interesting, and I hadn't thought about this connection until today, actually. I was reading uh, over the book of Ruth, and I'd read this several times, and it dawned on me today. When Boaz was going to marry Ruth, he mentions uh, over there in about chapter 4, he mentions the following. The Lord, Jehovah, Make the woman that is come into thine house, that's going to be Ruth, like Rachel and like Leah. Isn't that interesting? She is remembered way down the line, and I'd never thought of that before. So she's making an impact. And then we also find later in life, and this is most interesting about Leah, that the, Joseph learned the faithfulness of God really counts. She was faithful. Uh, at the end of his daddy's life, Jacob's life, we're, we're going down to Egypt now and they were down there. And it says in Genesis 49, 29, and he charged them and said unto them, um, I am to be gathered unto my people. This is Jacob talking to Joseph. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephraim and Hittite. 31 says, there they buried, he says, Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac, Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. Not bury me with Rachel. I thought more about that. Uh, I think maybe his thinking might have changed. Uh, Rachel's long time gone, and that faithfulness makes a difference, doesn't it? She was devoted to him all the way through. I think that affects Joseph maybe more than his mother. Seeing his aunt, how faithful she was in the home, watching, watching, watching. She just kept at it, and uh, God blessed her. The other side of that, 
his uncle Esau. And I'm going to go real quick. I'll be done in just a minute. Joseph heard a lot about this godless and carnal un uncle named Esau that daddy had tricked. Uh, the uncle was granddad's favorite, you remember that. And uh, the one who had dashed his hope, Esau, of, of blessing his birthright, he sold it for just a bowl of stew. And Jacob tricked him out of it. Mother helped. All this is what Joseph has heard. He's never met uh, Uncle Esau. All the skullduggery that went on in that home, man. Uh, he'd only heard of him when the family moved uh, into the territory back over uh, toward uh, the land of Canaan. And uh, they started traveling that way, and Dad's going to meet Uncle Esau, and Joseph's going to meet him for the first time. I think the fear in Jacob's face could be seen. And uh, the boys had to be fearful themselves, realizing that Uncle Esau had determined to kill his brother if he ever got a chance. When Daddy dies, I'm going to kill you. And that's why he left that area. And so much so that, uh, remember they send, he sends presents and, that doesn't work, and he finally puts the, the handmaids out in front, and he's putting the family out in front until they get to that little brook Jabbok, and Jacob says, I'm going to send you back across the river. I'm going to talk to God. Joseph knows what's going on in the sense that he sees what his dad's doing. The whole family was fearful that Esau was going to kill them. When Esau arrives, he arrives with 400 fighting men, and the dust clouds coming closer. I can see this. Wow. Joseph saw his uncle for the first time as uh, reprobate as he was. Instead of killing them all, he jumped off his horse, embraced his brother Jacob, welcomed him home. That's got to make an impression. As godless as Esau was, God calls him a profane man. He forgave his brother. As godless as he was, I thought this today, that's better than some church members. They can't forgive one another. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, but let me tell you what, this had an impact on Joseph. Joseph's going to be sown into slavery, and his brother's going to treat him wrong, and they're going to be down there in Egypt, and he's going to have the power to kill every one of them. But he doesn't. wonder where he got that idea that you ought to forgive. Might be from old Esau. Let me give you one quick one. This will, I'll close about two minutes here. Let's talk about uh, his father Jacob, and I've got just a paragraph or two. Jacob, uh, uh, or Joseph learned many lessons from Jacob, his father, what to do and not do in life. Jacob made a lot of bad choices, made some good choices, but made some bad choices. He served God in spite of all of that. Jacob's the one that certainly told Joseph about a personal God, the God of Abraham and Isaac, and recounted all of that. Jehovah, the all-powerful, all-knowing, living God. He certainly told Joseph he'd met him at Bethel. There's no doubt about that. And he'd chosen him instead of Esau, his brother. God chose him. God is sovereign. I, I can't figure all that out, but God is sovereign. And uh, the God who meets with men. There's a change in dad in Genesis 32. At that little uh, river, uh, Ford stream of Jabbok, Joseph knew his father was over there meeting with God, seeking God for help. All night he was over there. He came back changed. Physically, Dad now had a limp because God had touched him. That's a pretty good reminder, especially to a boy, young man. But also, he came back and he said, uh, now I'm going to have this limp because God has touched uh, my hip, the hollow of my thigh. And he came back and he said, I, I met God face to face, and God said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. Israel. Uh, for as a prince thou hast power with God, with men has prevailed. Jacob is a living example of the good and bad. Hey, what do we learn here? Let me get through this because I'm a little bit over tonight. Number one, God's ways are beyond our understanding. Don't try to tell me that you can figure out this uh, sovereign choices of God with Jacob. And uh, God plans working. God is sovereign and makes his own choices. I really can't understand everything God does. 
back side, way back when. I can't understand everything God does now. But God knows what he's doing. We do influence those in our family. You do, you do, you do. God works with many people. Uh, blesses those he wants to bless, those that follow him. And God has a plan. Not always we can see it, but God does. Hey, let's uh, have prayer. I'm a little bit over tonight. Uh, if Ashton was here, she'd have been doing that earlier. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you for the study of Joseph. We've already learned some things tonight. Help us to learn some good things in the future. And I know we will from your word and from the life of this man. Thank you for our church. Bless our service. Lord.